Welcome, everybody. Thanks for taking your time to be here. We're going to jump right into it. And so I just want to say that there's a lot of content in this presentation, and I'm going to do my best to kind of move through it at a comfortable speed. I have a good amount of time here. Um, Scott, would you be able to help me with the time, too? Are we, are we like, tight on time? I just want to make sure that I don't uh, go over. You have an hour and 15 minutes. An hour and 15 minutes. Okay. Um, and you could go a little past that. Okay, cool. So yeah, and uh, I can probably do some questions at the end if you guys want to do questions. But in general, I'm just going to try to move through the presentation and make sure I get it all across because there's quite a lot here. So yeah, I'm here to talk about Anastasia, the Ringing Cedars of Russia, and the New Civilization. So what is all this about? What is the New Civilization? Who is Anastasia? Why does what she said matter? Um, all these things we're going to discover here. So Scott, can you help me with the first slide here? Boom. Okay, what is the Ringing Cedars of Russia book series about? I mean, what is it not about? <laughs> so can we, next slide please? This one's a quick one. All right, so a little bit about the books is that um, they were written by Vladimir Nagri in the 90s in Russia, and they sold 30 million copies worldwide, 30 plus languages, at least 700,000 in English, and that statistic is kind of old. And that doesn't factor in the used book market and all these things. And uh, this was with no advertising loan. This was no money spent on marketing. This is just people feeling the inspiration from the books and wanting to get them. And so uh, what happened in the books, what the story is, is that in 1994, um, Vladimir Nagri, who was a entrepreneur in Russia at the time, he was doing trade expeditions up and down the Old River in northern Siberia, Russia. And so he was trading with the locals there and basically one time on his, he had big like, you know, caravan of ships, right? And he would go and stop at these local villages. He would trade with the people there, and, you know, go back and forth up the river. And one time when he was there, he met these two Siberian uh, elders and they started to tell him about these ringing cedar trees. And they said, I need you to send 50 of your men with me into the forest to cut down this special Siberian cedar. It's called a ringing cedar. And it's ringing because after 550 years of its life, it has started to accumulate so much energy from the stars and the sun and the moon. And it's trying to give it back to humanity, but it can't unless we cut it down and, and help fulfill its purpose. So Vladimir is very intrigued by all these things that they share with him and uh, everything about the cedar. They tell him that God created the cedar to store cosmic energy and to give it back to people. And so he wasn't able to do it, but he was very curious. So he came back a year later to uh, meet these elders again, but they weren't there. Who he met was their granddaughter, Anastasia. And uh, this was just like a, a model who Vladimir hired to, uh, <clears throat> to look like her. But he spends three days with her there, and she takes him deep into the Siberian taiga, which is the Siberian high northern forest up there. And so it's all Siberian cedar trees, and she tells him about uh, everything in the world. And her family line has lived uh, separately from the rest of humanity for thousands and thousands of years. They represent uh, an entirely different civilization, which I'm gonna get into in a minute here. Um, but basically, Anastasia and her people her grandfathers and her family have retained all the knowledge of our, what she calls pristine origins, where we come from, like how we were when God made us in the beginning and how everything was meant to be. And so she talks about everything. She talks about mankind's purpose for existence, our relationship with God, our true relationship with nature, raising children who are going to be in the image of God, right? Creating happy families where love doesn't go away between the people and the families. Right? And also turning this world into a pristine, flourishing garden, how everyone can live happily in a, a beautiful paradise garden with their families and surrounded by neighbors and communities. Right? So the next slide, please. So about Anastasia, who is she more specifically? Why does what she say, uh, what she said matters? So Magret describes her like this. He says, she lives in the forest altogether alone. She has no house to call her own and she hardly wears any clothes and doesn't even store any supplies. She's the descendant of people who have been living here for thousands of years and represents what is literally a different civilization. She and those like her have survived to the present day through what I can only term the wisest possible decisions. Anastasia was born here 
and is an integral part of the nature and the natural surroundings. She didn't go off into the forest simply for a time, as they, he's referring to like Buddha, Jesus, Moses, etc., um, as they did. She was born in the taiga and visits our world only for brief periods. And one extraordinary ability she has is when she's talking about something, pictures of the events that she's narrating arise in your consciousness for an actual space like a hologram, like you would see in this picture here. Um, this is just an artistic representation, obviously. But the images are three-dimensional and they're complete with smells and sounds of the time that she's describing. So she's able to clearly look into the past and the future um, and share these things. So he says that Anastasia has shown me pictures from the lives of people of a variety of periods, starting from the very creation of the world. And nearly all of the events that she shows are connected with her ancestors. And if you want to try to characterize her capabilities in one phrase, you could say that she preserves the experiences and emotions of the members of her extended family, starting with the creation of the very first human in her genetic memory and is able to call them up at will. And she can also model pictures of people's lives from the future. And so, yeah. Can we? Sure. The danger is that we're going to hear this is a myth rather than it's reality. Sure. Sure. So this is something that, um, yeah, and we could probably also address this at the end, but the thing is that she says, you know, I exist for those for whom I exist, right? Does she exist for you? Of course, why would I be here? <laughs> well, why would I be doing this? <laughs> um, yeah, I mean, of course. I mean, and for millions of other people she exists. But the important thing is that whether she exists or not is not the point. I'm just trying to tell you where this information that I'm about to share is coming from and how it was presented and, and why. But if you don't believe she exists, that's up to you. But the important thing is that if the information resonates in your heart, if it does something in your soul or touches you in a way, and you can also see the results of the lives of millions of people who've read these books and what they've done in the world, which you're going to see in the presentation. So if these things move you, that's the important thing. You don't have to believe a word of saying, right? You don't have to believe anything. I'm not here to make anyone believe me. Um, and so, yeah, I think that's, that's a bit about her. So we can go to the next slide, please. And so she tells Vladimir, they're spending this time together in the forest, and she's telling him about life, about God, about happy children, turning this earth into a beautiful garden, and all these things, every subject you could imagine. So she tells him, in the book you're going to write, there's going to be unobtrusive combinations formulations made up of letters, and they will arouse in the majority of people good and radiant feelings, capable of overcoming ailments of body and soul, and will facilitate the birth of a new awareness inherent in the people of the future. She says, believe me, this is not mysticism. It's in accord with the laws of the universe. This is, she said this in 1994 before he wrote a single book, and all of it came true, because the words that he put in the books made people want them so much. Right, 30 million copies around the world with not a single dollar spent on advertising. It's incredible. Um, so, please continue. So he goes, he spends his time with her, and then he goes back and starts to ponder everything that he's experienced with her, everything that has happened. Um, and one thing I forgot to mention is that she has all kinds of abilities and powers that she says are inherent in man, right? Inherent in man, um, not man or woman, but just us as children of God, she can do all kinds of things. She can see the past, the future. She can teleport her body. She can heal people. She can read people's minds. But none of that is that important. She's trying to say that she can, she wants everybody to experience these things because it's all inherent in all of us, right? To see things from a distance and to see the past and the future and to remember our past, right? Um, so... He goes a few more times to see Anastasia over the years, and he writes about everything um, that he experiences. He has an incredible memory. He shares about everything. Um, and the first quote that I want to share, he asks her, he says, what do you think awaits our civilization? She says, in the long term, a realization of the futility of the technocratic path of development and a movement back to our pristine origins. And I think that's where we are here. I think everyone in this room can see that we have definitely seeing the futility of the technocratic path of development and we are moving back to our origins. So it's, I'm happy to be speaking here at an event where people 
feel this way and see these things. And I really loved what Charles was saying about all this yesterday. Um, so we can continue. So I want to talk about maybe what's considered maybe the most important book in the series. I brought my copy with me. Um, book four here, co-creation, right? And so listen, if you guys want to read the books after this, it's up to you. I'm just going to share what is in these books and what it's all about. And so Vladimir is talking with Anastasia's grandfather and he tells him, this is after he's written most of the books. He says, uh, the appearance of a new, well-grounded thought about the interrelationship of God and man signals the appearance of a new significant book for the first time in 2000 years. And when he's saying significant books, he's talking about the Bible, the Quran, the Tao, Bhagavad Gita, those kinds of tiers of books, right? These are the books that shape human society. There's one or two or three fundamental thoughts in each of these books. And the people who read them, they play out their life in this way, right? And that's how the whole world is basically been. And so he says that co-creation contains new thoughts and it's well-grounded. And the main thought of this book states in a clear and well-grounded manner precisely what God wants of man and what man's purpose is. You can go to the next slide. And so it's summed up very simply. Um, Anastasia is telling the story of creation in this book. She talks about the creation of Adam and the earth and the creation of Eve and their life together, how they lived, what they did, how the universe came into being and all of these things. And so she's talking about when God was creating the universe. This is where she's uh, where she starts here. Um, these elements of the universe are in a conversation with God and they ask him, you know, they see him creating this beautiful creation of, of the world and man and everything. And they see him doing this and they ask him, what do you so fervently desire? Why are you so inspired in working to create all of this? And he replies, conjoint creation and joy for all from its contemplation. Conjoint creation together and joy for everyone from contemplating what has been created, right? And so, and they ask him again, you know, what may bring joy to everyone in the universe? He replies, birth. And they ask him, a birth of what? Um, and so we're going to get into what is, what is birthed. Um, but this is an important thing. This is a single sentence that can sum up God's desire for us and his relationship with us and how we are intended to live on this earth. So I'll get into this in a bit more. Next slide, please. So we have to begin with, we have to begin with land. Right? So Anastasia in this book, in book four here, the co-creation, she's telling everyone, she says, take back your motherland, people. That's what she tells people. Take back your motherland. Because all of us live on this earth and none of us have a piece of the motherland to call our own. We don't have a space for our family. Right? You can't even, it's really difficult to get land for a lot of people. Right? And we're disconnected from this earth and how we were intended to live. Right? And she tells people to, to take back the motherland, right? And this is a profound thing to create a space on this earth for you and your family. So she says the whole earth could be a motherland for each one of its inhabitants and man could be caressed by everything in the universe. But for that to happen, he would need to join together all the planes of being into a single point, call it his motherland and create with his own self a space of love there. I'm going to explain all these things. And then she says, all the best things of the universe would come into contact with it firsthand, with, uh, come, in, co come into contact with the space of your motherland. You and yourself will feel the whole vast universe through this point, and you will possess power unsurpassed. And they will know about this in other worlds. Everything will serve you as God, our creator, wanted. So she's saying, what she says earlier in the series is that to understand, it's very simple. God has materialized himself in nature, right? All of nature is God's materialized thoughts. It's his body. These are his thoughts, it's his consciousness, it's his body. And by consciously interacting with these things, we can have a relationship with him and understand him and begin to create, right? To understand and to consciously communicate with nature is to understand God and his, his intention and his spirit and all of those things. And so she says, we take a single piece of land and call it our motherland and build a space here and the whole universe will, we can feel the whole universe through this space, right? So I'm gonna to start to tell some more about this. Next slide, please. 
And so, again, about the importance of the land, the motherland, and all these things, and creating this space, she says, let the people hear about what others have tried for a thousand years to hide from them, about how it takes hardly a moment for any, any one of them to enter the Creator's pristine garden and there bring about splendid conjoint creations with Him. The most important thing, Vladimir, is that even today, everyone can build a home. Everyone can feel God with their soul and live in paradise, right? This is how we're supposed to live. One single moment is all that separates paradise from people living on the earth today. And when she says one single moment, she's saying a moment of realization in our mind that we decide that this is how we want to live, right? Once you've decided it, you decide that this is where you're going to go, that's it. You're already in that reality to a certain degree. It exists, right? And so we should live in paradise, right? Like, I'm not sure if you can see the uh, little painting behind here. I should have brought my copy of it. I have a canvas, but it's a beautiful family living on a space uh, that they've created and they have a child there and it's just this beautiful piece of paradise, right? And that's what this is all about. Everybody should be able to enjoy this. So next slide, please. So she talks about what is this particular piece of the motherland that we're talking about here? She gets more specific. Um, she calls it a kin's domain, right? the domain, the space of our family. Right? And so when we say kin, it's past, it's present, and it's future. So you take a piece of land and you can settle your entire family line there. You can redeem your ancestors, you know, you can settle your present family there and you have more generations of your family uh, come and live in this spot and get birthed in this spot, right? And you hand it down to them in perpetuity forever. So imagine um, you have one hectare of land uh, two and a half acres. So she recommends this two and a half acres because she says it's the right amount of land that we can manage by ourselves and have a direct relationship with. The whole point isn't to live off the grid and homestead. That's kind of like secondary. The main point is the conscious interaction and creation on this, right? You are interacting with every blade of grass, every flower. It all knows you, right? You plant it with love and it's trying to give that back to you, right? The plants have a, have a purpose in this world and we're supposed to be able to consciously communicate with them. And when we do this with love, they're going to reflect this love back at us. And so she talks about you, you create a living paradise garden home for yourselves and your family to pass on perpetuity. Right. And so this is the space that she was talking about through which you can have power unsurpassed, through which you can feel the whole universe. Right. Because you have a connection with everything growing there. It was planted by you, inspired and loved. And so it's trying to reach out to the universe and bring these energies back to you. Right. And so uh, you. Um, yeah, I think that about covers it. So we're going to get into more of this. But the kin's domain is proposed as the solution to the crisis that we're facing in the world. And you guys are going to see if we go to the next slide here. So the model, what is it? It's not a cut and dry kind of thing. Everybody builds the exact same kind of thing. It's much more of your inspiration, right? You take this hectare of land and with whatever you feel in your heart, you manifest it there. But she gives some general guidelines. And this is a, a pretty cool permaculture style design that somebody did in Russia, you can see the kind of diversity growing on, you know, a two and a half acre piece of land like that. It's pretty big. And so she, she says, first, you have to pick a place out of all the spaces in the world that's most pleasing to you in a climate that's pleasing to you. And then it's going to be pleasing to your family and everybody that comes after you. Right? So first you select the spot, but then you do a multicolored hedge of all kinds of uh, trees here. So you have a living fence, right? That marks off the space and creates a barrier here. You see it goes all the way around. And then you have 50 to 75% of this reserved for some kind of forest of a variety of trees, you know, food forests, nuts, orchard, you know, wood trees, pines, whatever, all these kinds of things. And so, you know, you can plant uh, bushes in between the trees that are growing. You can have currants, and raspberries, and blueberries, and all the other kinds of berries that exist out there. 
in this room and, and they have concerts here all the time um, and birthdays and they teach the school here. Um, so, yeah, it was like a geodesic dome. Yeah, and they have a few of them on that settlement interspersed in different locations because it's huge. Um, and they're like public spaces. So, more concerts, more happy gatherings here. Uh, people finding their soulmates, right? And being in love and being happy. Um, so this is a settlement kind of from the air. These different squares you can see. This is a little baby that was, you know, he was birthed on the domain. But look at this. This, this little picture kind of really touched my heart because it's like um, children should get to live like that, you know? They should get to be out in nature. And, and experience these things themselves and not be caught up in this technocratic, artificial world. I never got to experience anything like that. Um, I know probably a lot of us didn't, but this little guy is gonna grow up happy and free. He's gonna understand God and he's gonna understand nature, you know? And he's gonna know how to live life and live happily, right? Um, these are called dolmens. That's a whole other subject. Um, this little guy again, he was just adorable. Uh, this is another, group of, of happy people on their settlement, just um, celebrating something, I'm sure, as they always are. Are you, More? Taking, are you taking some of these pictures or are you just finding them? I didn't take these photos, I compiled all these. These are all from, I don't know how many different settlements are here that I'm showing. Another, another woman is very happy about uh, building her house, you know? Look at that though, she's happy and she's free, right? She's building what she wants in her life. It's beautiful. Um, people make their own products. This is a guy making um, oil probably from the Siberian cedar, pressing the nuts, making oil. Um, and this oil is worth pound for pound more than gold. And uh, it can heal all kinds of diseases. So you may want to look into it. People, uh, kids planting trees with their parents. Beautiful, right? Planting some cedars. And uh, yeah, just people living happily and freely. I got some more photos of another settlement here. Just gonna breeze through this real quick. This one's a pretty developed one. They've got a gate, and they've got roads, and they've got electricity and all that. Um, the settlements are at various degrees of development and infrastructure. Not all of them have this, but um, this is kind of the central area. They've got all kinds of buildings and things like this. Um, they're always, you know, it's always festive. There's always gatherings. Just people doing their thing. They have markets, right? They come and people sell their products that they create. Uh, people come and camp for the festivals, cute little kids, right? It's adorable. Um, everybody's happy. This is in the middle of a concert here. This is a one particular domain from the sky. And the interesting thing about the domains is that they express your level of consciousness, right? Some people, when I went there, I remember uh, there was a one domain across from us that was like two really big houses, a Range Rover parked in the front, and like barely any trees. And then the place next door had a completely grown hedge, you couldn't see inside, a relatively small house and just an abundant like paradise heaven garden. And everyone kind of expresses it differently. So none of them really look the same. And it really shows kind of where we are at in our own consciousness and what we embody outside of us, right? Um, so this one is it's pretty beautiful. Um, moving on, happy festivals. You know, they, they do their own schooling and they're doing all kinds of interesting stuff. Um, yeah, the kids having fun there for sure. Uh, here we go, more happy festivals. Singing, dancing, I think you guys get the image, right? And so why I wanted to share these pictures is because I want you guys to see that like none of this, what I'm saying is just theory, this is real. Um, people have been living this way like as long as I've been alive, you know what I mean? Um, and it's, it's a huge thing that's happening across the world and it's very real. And the interesting thing is that everyone, the different, one of the differences about the eco villages is um, Pretty much everyone has the same overarching philosophy. Why are there, why is there like thousands and thousands, you know, of kin's domain settlements particularly? They're called that, they call themselves that, 
right? They all have the same kind of way of thinking. All the people that move there have the same aspiration, right? And it's not um, just an isolated thing. They continue to grow. Um, the movement just continues and grows and grows and more settlements are being created every day. We're watching them pop up here in the United States. You know, we have like groups of people in this area who are trying to do this now. Um, and all over the United States, that's happening. Um, so, sorry, I'm like butting in. I'm like butting in here. Um, but, uh, so, and listen, I don't want to say anything like, it's, this is not some, I don't want you guys to misunderstand me. This is not some like, you know, evil village bash type of thing. I'm just saying they're different, right? Um, and one of the differences is that, again, there's not this focus on creating a community for the sake of the community. The difference is that a family wants to create a happy life for their family. They get their piece of land and do this. And that's the main intention. And then all these other families who want to do the same thing, they come together and they do it together. They're not necessarily saying like, we're going to create a community just for the sake of the community. And actually when um, settlements of people have done that, they have found that it doesn't really work. The community, you know, this group of people and all this isn't the end of itself, right? group of people together and sharing everything is not necessarily the end, it's, it's a means. And a means to what? It's like trying to have a happy family and just living your life freely, <laughs> right? And so every family has their own private hectare of land where they're sovereign, right? They can do whatever they want. In general, people don't pollute the land. They don't do nonsensical technocratic things with their land. So in general, everybody lives in relative harmony, right? Um, and so, yeah, like one of the, one of my friends, she said, I want to be one of many, but I still want to be myself. You have your own private space, but you're in a community where everybody else has their own private space. You can be self-sufficient on your land. You can trade with other people. You have communal spaces, like all these spaces that I showed you earlier, where you can do schooling, have events, and do things together with your community, but you're not obligated to, right? And you always have your privacy and your sovereignty. Um, so that's one of the key differences. I think there are a lot of people that need to use private. Well, two, two and a half acres of land, everybody completely private. It's not exactly like that. Um, there probably are that are probably close in the direction, but I think it's just specifically, it's a, di it's a different thing. But I would agree with you in general. Um, so talking about the spirituality of this, right? Um, you give material embodiment to your spirituality, right? This is such an important thing because so many people are just talking about spirituality. And we say we're spiritual, but we keep supporting the growth of the technocratic world. Do you know what I mean? It's still going. And what are we doing? Um, and so, right, um, Vladimir has this wonderful quote from the books that I'd love to read and share with people where he says, let each one of us take a small plot of his land, one hectare, right? pull his whole mind and whole spirituality together and create a very small but concrete paradise. He will transform his little piece of land on our large planet into a flourishing garden, giving a material embodiment to his spirituality, following God's example. If millions of people do this in a whole lot of countries, then the whole earth will become a flourishing garden. A father and mother who are actually creating a space of love for their children are more spiritual than the most celebrated wise men who only talk about spirituality. Let the spirit of each man spring up from the ground as a beautiful flower, a tree with fragrant fruit, and let this take place on every single hectare of our planet, right? This is my will. This is the will of many people who've read the Ringing Cedar series, and I think that this is how I want to see the future, right? We talk about, we're talking about the next five years here, right? And when I, when Charles was talking about the next five years and I was thinking, what do I see in the next five years? I'm the director of this Anastasia Foundation. I'm connected with everybody who is trying to do this in the English speaking world. Guys, it's like so beautiful. I see so many people going and buying land and doing this. The next five years that I see is unbelievably inspiring, right? It's future, it's communities. Right? These kinds of communities popping up, people saying, I want to give birth to my children in this beautiful space and raise them there and hand it down to them. 
like I get to see all this every single day. You know, the next five years is we're going to see many of these communities starting and getting their rooting in the United States, in Canada, in other English speaking countries, right? All around the world, even non English speaking countries. We have people in Germany, we have people in Bali, um, everywhere, right? It's an amazing thing. Um, so we can continue here. Wow, guys, I'm kind of flying through this. Are you guys, how are you guys doing? Is this okay? Like, yeah. I'm afraid you're gonna run out of time. Yeah, I'm gonna do my best to get through. How am I doing off time? I got just 36 minutes. 36 minutes. Okay, I'm doing relatively decent. But uh I should probably try to call you faster. I have a burning question. Okay, we'll do it. How is it is it like some medicine and a seizure oil that keeps them happy? Like every woman has a menstrual yeah. situation. Sure. Family has sure. Sure. Why is it so happy and beautiful? Right. Well, I mean it's not like people don't have problems. For sure. Okay. Yeah, I mean, people have problems. Even people who are neighbors on settlements, they have little disagreements with each other. And there's interpersonal things, right? I think the happiness stems from the fact that they're following the image or, or the desire or the program that God kind of set forth for us. They are creating a beautiful space. I'm going to talk more about this, right? About exactly what I, what I mean here. Um, I guess I'm kind of on it right now, actually. Um, actually, the next slide will probably get it better. But one of the important concepts that Anastasia talks about in the books, she talks about perfecting the dwelling land, right? Uh, for those of you who didn't know, there is a book 10. Some people don't know about that. This is from the 10th book. Um, she says, these are the most important words of all the divine programs, right? Um, with their help, it's possible to determine the degree, uh, I can't even read this, to which both an individual person and mankind as a whole are necessary for the universe. With their help, it's possible to determine the usefulness or uselessness of the earthly laws conceived by people. So perfecting the dwelling land is perfecting yourself. Taking a piece of land that is empty, like a canvas or something, and creating something more beautiful there, creating more beauty in life, is perfecting you. And this cycle of feedback continues indefinitely. You can continuously do this, right? Um, so you can, perfecting the dwelling land means giving birth to and raising children who are more perfected than yourself, right? Than you yourself. Each generation should be more perfected than the previous. And for this to come about, the generation that comes before should present the next generation with a more perfected dwelling land, right? We can create our space of beauty as best as we can. And then the next generation comes in and, and goes from there. Right. And they continue to improve on it and for infinity. Right. Because the other path is the world just keeps getting worse. Right. The technocratic path keeps going. We keep more discre more destruction, more pollution, more um, desecration of nature. Right. So logically, in the way that God would want us to live, is that we continuously cre keep creating more perfection, right? There isn't an end to this uh, beauty that we keep creating, right? And so, yes, yeah, the mother planting a uh, tree with a child here, we can continue. Okay, so I think this is, this is starting to get to your question here. Um, I think maybe the next slide will probably do it, but... Oh, no, I'm sorry. I'm getting back. It's like doing its thing. <laughs> that was me. Okay, got it. Um, and so, what is this about space and love? I've said this a few times. I've talked about when you plant these trees and you build this garden and all this, the love gets reflected back at you, right? Preserving love in families, right? Uh, why do people, why does love vanish? Um, and so, this place that you create, this kin's domain, this space, she calls it a space of love, right? It's a place where you have fulfilled the conditions requisite for love to abide with you and to not leave, right? She talks about how love tries to come and visit everybody, but because of our lifestyle, the way we live, everybody has different interests. We live in apartments completely isolated from nature. We have no common aspiration together towards the future and all of these things. Um, love will not stay in a lot of these conditions, right? It's because of how we live. Right. And so um, this is a beautiful little house. These people did all this wood carving themselves. It's pretty incredible. But um, yeah, I kind of covered this so we can go to the next slide. So I want to read another quote here about love and all of these things that she says. 
Love does not tease anyone, and it does not play games. It tries to stay with everyone forever, but man chooses his own way of life. And this way of life frightens the energy of love. And love cannot give inspiration to annihilation. It's unseemly for the offspring of love to live in torment when he and she are beginning to build a new life together, when they're endeavoring to establish a home in an apartment resembling a vaultless life of stone, a, vaultless life, a vault of lifeless stone. When each, when each has their own work and interests and their own environment, when there's no common vision of the future, no conjugal aspirations, when their bodies are attracted by mere fleshly alleviation, only to hand over their child to the cruel ways of a world devoid of clean water, a world filled with bandits, and wars, and disease. It's from all of this that the energy of love flees, right? It's how we're living, it's this culture, it's the, our, how we live our lives on a daily basis, right? People are completely um, separate, they don't have similar interests, right? With this, they have a desire to co-create a space together, and it's an eternal thing that's gonna live past them, right? And hand it down to their children. It's something that binds people together very strongly, right? And so even though they will have problems and things that will arise in their life, by and large, they feel like they're fulfilling their purpose. They're creating a beautiful space for the next generation. They're living their life in harmony with nature and God, right? Um, so the next slide here. Last thing about this. So she tells people, right? She's telling Vladimir, in the books, imagine that he and she, you know, a, a man and woman, in theory, um, begin in their love to implement this design, right? Everything about the kin's domain that I was showing and talking about, they begin to do this. Um, they will plant family trees and herbs in the ground and together with an orchard. And how happy they will be in the spring when their co-creations burst forth into bloom. Love will eternally dwell between them, in their hearts, and all around, in this space. And each will see the other in a spring flower, remembering how they planted a flowering tree together. And the taste of raspberries will remind them of the taste of love, since in the autumn he and she, in love for each other, touch the twig of the raspberry bush. Once they start working on the orchard, the energy of love will multiply itself and never forsake either of them. After all, their way of life will help them both live their lives in love and convey the space of love to their children in continuation and help them raise their children together with God and his image and likeness, right? And this is, this is really what I'm getting at. It's like, how can we actually uh, live this life? And this is the way it's okay. Next slide, please. All right. Oh, you have a, you have a thing. That's incredible. Would you like to? Yeah, I didn't know. Sorry, man, I don't want to bother you. Next week. This is a man, tech, technocracy, really. Um, technocracy. Okay, back. So, uh, another thing I was talking about fulfilling our purpose for why we were created, right? When God made the earth and the universe, what happened was he had this thought which became a dream. And what he did is he created the earth and the cosmos and the stars and the moon and all of this, and the sun. Then he created the earth, and the water, and the plants, and the birds, and everything beautiful and good. And then, after all of this beautiful, uh, this beautiful space was created, he created man, and gave us this place, right? To live in, and to be happy, and to enjoy, right? Be fruitful and multiply, right? Uh, steward this world, take care of it. And so, when we, in our minds, are inspired, to create uh, a similar space, right? We say, I'm gonna take this space and create this beauty here. I'm gonna create this paradise here. I'm gonna give birth to children here. You're, you're mimicking the actions of God himself. You're literally mimicking the actions that he took when he created the earth and the water and the flowers and everything, this beautiful garden of Eden, and then put Adam and Eve here, right? We're literally doing the exact same thing. And so we're living in the image of God, right? We are, we are, we are creators. And we are creating beauty and joy, right? Back to what I said in the beginning. What can, you know, conjoint creation and joy for all from its contemplation, right? What are creations that bring joy to everyone? Well, these kinds of beautiful paradise spaces, right? Gardens, clean air, you know, clean water, healthy, happy children, giving birth to these beautiful babies. And, and that brings joy to everyone. Who, who, who wouldn't see a baby like that and not smile? You know what I'm saying? 
Um, and so, you know, we do the exact same thing and we are repeating God's actions in an infinitely repeating cycle. And now we are living our, our true purpose, why we're here. How am I gonna do this? Oh, I went back. And for this crowd, I wanted to go just a little bit deeper, right? Because I think this is an important point. So Anastasia talks about immortality. Man was created immortal, right? We're all aware of reincarnation. Maybe some people believe in it, some people don't. What about the original, uh, the first English translation? It was pretty good. Can you repeat the questions right now? Oh, okay, I can repeat the question. Yeah, that's a great idea. Um, so Tommy asked if the original texts were written in Russian. I said they were written in Russian, and he asked me if Vladimir had supervised the translation into English. Um, he did not. Uh, it's in many different languages, and they've all done a pretty good job. Uh, but we're actually going to be retranslating them, and I think we're going to do a better job than the previous ones. You speak Russian? I actually do. My wife is Russian. Really? Yeah, she's taught me a lot of Russian. But my vocabulary is very bringing Cedars focus. I know how to say like lots of beautiful things. You know what I mean? Uh, yes. Um, when I think of Siberia, I think of the coldest place in the world. Where it's right. On the short sleeves and the. Uh, right. I'm just wondering. Yeah. And, and how. How she lives there. How she lives there. And yeah. Not wearing clothing. And I, That's a great I question. I understand if you. You know, your your understanding is what makes you whole. You know, that's sure. what is she. And right. I understand that part, but I'm I'm not seeing any snow or bears. So that's not Siberia. All the pictures that I show, and some of that is Siberia. We've got friends in Siberia, but Anastasia, her family's lived there for millenniums. You know, uh, millennia, and you know she's very well, just physically adapted to that kind of environment. Um, you know, we have examples like Wim Hof, right? Like you can learn how to go and hike up a mountain with new shorts in like minus 20 Celsius weather. You can do that now in this lifetime. Um, so her family's just been living that way uh, for quite a long time and she's very well adapted to it. Um, and in the winter, actually, she kind of goes into like a hibernation kind of thing. Um, she winds up just putting her body to rest through the whole winter and she just kind of sleeps the whole thing through. Um, and she's just traveling, you know, out of her body through, through the winter. Um, so yeah, I mean, in that kind of climate, like, winter is pretty long and rough and not much for her to do, so she just, uh, sleeps the whole thing. They do have summer. Yeah, right. Yeah. Um, I'm not sure who went first. Did you have your hand up? Okay. Um, so, two connected questions. Yeah. What's the community? relationship with the local government. Definitely. And then how is the property structure set up? Yep. Like, do they buy from a private owner? Yep. Or is it like a developer? It's a great question. Um, so you're asking about how um, the community's relationships with the local governments and how these communities are structured, how they buy the land. And so in general, especially in Russia, because they've had decades of like this kind of experience, um, they generally foster pretty positive relationships with the local governments, right? They're diplomatic. They make them aware of what they're doing. Um, they don't ask for permission if they don't need it, but they are friendly and good to the local government because honestly, the activity that they're doing is a benefit for the local government. They're creating so much value on their land, creating all these different kinds of products, tourism, right? These big festivals that they do. Um, so the local governments really love them. And actually, one thing I didn't mention in my presentation, especially in Russia, this is going to blow your minds, um, is that currently they're voting on a law for the entire um, country, for everyone to get two and a half acres of land completely free to do this, like in Russia. So, you know, let's not talk about all the other things about that country, but let's just look at that, right? And so let's also say that in 2017, they passed a law called the Far East Hectare Act. Far East Hectare Act. And they started giving out land in the Far East. Um, in the first week, I think they received 114,000 applications um, for a hectare of land from different people in the Russian Far East. They broke the website um, in like the first week. Um, so this is happening in a way bigger way than we would imagine. And there's other provinces in Russia, um, you know, all less, you know, call them states, where they have passed these laws on kin's domains. I have friends where they've gone together as a group to their local government and requested land uh, and were granted 150 acres 
for several families and started creating a settlement. And they got grants and stuff, and the government's just funding their development, and there's no strings attached. Yeah, that sounds like a, a utopian non-reality, but it, it, it is real, and I'm seeing it happen. So, and then the last thing about how people um, buy the land, in, in America, it's kind of different. Um, you know, I think land purchasing is more simple in Russia. Um, but there's a lot of ways to do it, like the ways you mentioned, you know, people owner financing or whatever. Um, you know, people get the land and they put it in trust, right? Um, hold it privately. Um, I don't know if you guys are aware of land patents, things like that. Um, but people get land patents for their land. And there's all these different ways of doing it. And as long as the ball gets rolling, um, the main thing is to ensure in the future that you own the land in perpetuity. So however you can get it for now is fine, right? But ensuring that you have that land in perpetuity is kind of more important. Um, so there's a, a whole bunch of ways, and I'm not technically versed enough to be able to say all those things. I hope that answers your question. Yes, sir. Uh, well, thank you for carrying the torch and drawing. My pleasure. Thank you. Uh, you know, a lot of what you know, what's described in that book in the twenty years ago when I was yeah. you know, eighteen and then yeah. when I found the books it was about twenty through twenty seventeen. Yeah. I read them all, so I couldn't do anything else. You know, so, all right. Yeah. And um and it was yeah, so, so it was amazing because it's like her dream was already through. Yeah. It already had come through like the pictures you're showing were things yes. I had seen. And now I'm looking at pictures of it yeah. like, wow. That's exactly what you were thinking, right? That's been the experience of so many people, myself included. I wanted to buy land and live off the grid and you know have my family this way. But when I encountered all this information, I'm like, this is what I want times a thousand. This is what I want, but like way clearer um, in more detail and then much more spirit behind it too. So it's interesting. I hear this all the time that people feel the same way. Wanted to also, you know, to us here, you know, you know, from that time I had that goal, I've been preparing everything that I can do. I know, like, we can talk about how many of us are preparing all the pieces in our life to do this. Yeah. Um, it's like, damn trust for 10 years, you know, that happens to all the work. Nice. Just preparing, preparing. Nice. I mean, red books, you know, I'm like, I knew it was just all part of it. So right. I think very real and sincere offer that I'm rearranging my entire life right now to me. Free and able to make this vision real. And then, I mean, I've been doing this very recently for many years, a lot of years, and we're going to be using planting and carpentry and everything. So I just would love for us, as well as a specific real community that's right here, you know, I, that, that I can get in, you know, connected to with, with the larger national networks and everything. Yeah. But I would love to, uh, to offer for all of you, you know, feel free to reach out. I would take contact. Can't follow up with it all and see what, where we can go with this. This is this my life. And I, I hope these, I hope this resonates with all of you. I'd love to work with you too. Yes, sir. Yeah. Yes. What's your name? I'm Michael. Michael. Yeah. Mm -hmm. Hi. Are you based here? Um, well, I'm, you know, I'm based on the planet Earth, so I'm not very much. I'm listening for where you're in college. Yeah, well, yeah, I'm, I'm you know, basically this year getting to know. So I'm going to be ready to, to go. You know, I'm connecting people on decision. I, know. I probably know them. Yeah. Yeah, that's interesting. Yeah, but let's definitely connect. And yeah, I mean, if people here feel called, right, we're here in the same room, right? And you know, there's no there's no rush either. It's like if you feel like you're ready for that later, everybody's on their own journey. I have a friend of mine who read the books in Russia like 20 years ago, and he has been looking for his land all of that time until now. And he finally kind of settled on East Texas um, for him in particular. But it's like he kept that dream alive and he kept going towards it. And right, and maybe for some people, you know, living on the land and doing this is too much. And in this lifetime, it's not going to happen. But the important thing is like creating, you know, Anastasia says, let your love illuminate those people living around you, right? Create a space of love around you, you know? Um, I remember I lived in, in a city in Hartford, Connecticut. Um, it's a lot of crime in that city. You know? Yeah, I grew up. I grew up in Hartford. She knows. Um, it's not a good city. Um, and but I, I rented um, an apartment from the most beautiful couple that I've ever seen. It was an older Sicilian man and an older Puerto Rican woman, and they had the most beautiful garden, rose garden. They had lemon trees with like 
lemons, he would bring them out in a pot and then put them back when it was cold. Uh, most beautiful rose garden, land that he'd been cultivating for decades and decades. And it was this beautiful space of like vibrant love that you could feel when you walked in there in the middle of all this death and desolation. Drug dealers and like crazy stuff happening right across the fence. Wild things. But what they had there was this beautiful heavenly place. Their family was always coming. You know, the grown adult kids were always coming back. Everybody was happy. They were always inviting me for dinner. And it's like, even if that's how we live in the city, we've done a holy thing. You know, you've brought love and joy to a place where there wasn't, you know? So I don't want to say everyone like, uh, go and, and abandon the cities too. It's what you feel called, right? Um, and whatever you're ready for, and just keep going. So more questions. Yes, sir. Really, really basic one. I know that you make books available for download. Yep. Uh, Seen that. Thank yep. you. Um, are they keen, like, if you just want to buy a copy that's being printed, yep. are they in English right now? Oh, man. Oh, so. <laughs> if, if the answer is, it's kind yeah, of the Yeah, answer, the answer is there's probably like 200 cents left. Wow. Um, so we were talking about the availability of the books in English. So this is kind of a thing. Um, for those of you who know, book one is probably going for like 60, 70 bucks used. Um, or new. 100. Yeah, like 100, depending on where you're going. Um, and so the thing is that they're out of print right now. And so, um, we have a book share group on our Telegram channel where people can offer and share the books with you if you want to do that. Yeah, we, uh, if you go on Anastasia.foundation, all of our links and everything are there. That's a, it's not AnastasiaFoundation.com, it's Anastasia.foundation. Um, so yeah, we've got Telegram groups like in a lot of states, um, different continents, you know, different languages. Um, so if you want to connect with people anywhere, uh, we have that. And we also have book sharing groups and stuff. But then, yeah, we have um, the PDFs are available. You can print them out. Um, there's a PDF to book printing service. That's probably like 17, 18 bucks per book. Pretty good. I've used it before, um, especially for people who want to read book 10 because it's not available in print. Um, so that's a better way to do it. And yeah, I'm working on it. I'm trying to get the books republished as fast as I can. There's a lot of things that I'm being held up on and it's not my fault. Um, so just give me some time. I swear to God, guys, like I really just want to do a good job, but it's way out of my hands. You know what I mean? Um, oh man, um, legal issues with the previous publisher, basically, um, you know, trademark things, copyright things, uh, just yeah, kind of a, a bit of a bit of controversy there, um, and so just trying to get all that cleaned up before we move forward. Okay, Scott. Uh, I live on a quarter acre, which if you if a hectare is two point five, then I got one tenth yeah. of a hectare. Yeah. So what? What about where you are? Like, if you have yeah. to be on less land right. than a kin's domain, how would that? Right. Is that do people do that? They do, certainly. Um, and right, there's people who are inspired by the books, but they don't necessarily have a hectare, but they're doing what they're able to in their space to create, you know, a space of love. It can be a space of love, even if there's, if it's smaller than a hectare, for sure. You're doing things with loving intention, right? You're doing, you're cultivating the land in an intentional way, right? And so that's a beautiful thing. And if that's what you have, you know, continue doing that. I'm sure you already have like a beautiful relationship with your land there. Um, and you know, or you're going to cultivate one, right? But that's, that's kind of the thing. So yeah, you, you know, eventually if you want to move to a hectare of land, you could do that. And it's a whole different experience, but you know, create the beauty that you can where you are. Certainly. Yeah. Yes, sir. I love how built into this, uh, particular idea for living is, uh, healing between men and women. Yeah. And it seems to me pretty clear that, uh, the difference between this and ego villages that in God's law and focus on monogamy. Um, so that just getting back to the prior right. discussion. And I'm wondering, you know, some of us have not endured a relationship. Sure. We have children, blended families, and sure. single people. Of course. So as the coordinator for the North American, I've, I've got yeah. the pieces up in the telegram, but just kind of the big picture of how, how are you working for that? Got it. Yeah, and so, um, you know, if people, not everyone has to like give birth to children, right? It's like you have grown, you have grown children, right? Um, and you know, you create, 
the stories that have come from Russia and even from people in the United States is like they begin creating this space and, um, you know, the children want to come back, right? They're inspired by that and they want to be there. And they're like, wow, look at what like dad's doing. This is so beautiful and interesting. Um, and they want to carry it on. There's stories about that in the books and, you know, stories that we've seen in real life. But, um, you know, so not everybody has to have children. And then also, um, you know, just creating the space is more important, right? Like having this space where the love that you feel between yourself and anyone, or even if you're alone, right? It's the love that you feel in your heart and you're going to create this space and maybe someone else will join you, you know, in the future. That happens a lot um, with people. Or maybe it's like, you, you just do what you can. Uh, does that answer your question? Yeah. Okay. Uh, yeah, beautiful. It's beautiful, brother. Thank you. Um, I, I know you had your hand up. I'm sorry. I kept like missing. It's all good. Yes. Down. Yeah. I, you, you might have said it already. Right, yeah. Sure. Did, uh, this is your hood? Correct. Yes. Yeah. yeah. I'm outside of Asheville. Right on. And you have like a regular meetup of total nature. So we're going to start. I was going to do my first Asheville area meetup like on this day, um, but the beautiful Dr. Edith got me involved in this event. And so I'm here. <laughs> so we can, um, I'm planning on doing something between now and like mid June. We've got a really cool event that's happening June 9th to 11th, but it's online. It's about land patents and all this stuff. Um, but yeah, um, I live here and, you know, hopefully it'll be creating some more community here. Yeah. Uh, also, might have this too, but the the ringing cedars, it's ringing when it wants to be cut down? So what happens is, it's a great question, is, um, and I have a, a picture of it on my back here. Um, this painting was done, and it's our logo. Uh, but basically, the ringing cedar is, it's, they live for 550 years in Siberian cedar tree. And so, after all that time of absorbing the cosmic energy from the sun and the stars and the moon and everything, it begins to build up so much that it starts to make an audible sound, like an electrical kind of power line to crack like sound. Um, and so that's the ringing, right? And they are very, very powerful at that point. Um, and actually this image is of like when a branch got broken off the top of the tree and this light and energy started pouring out of it back into space, you know, to, to come back to, to us, right? To be reflected on the planet. So that's what this is, is a depiction of. Um, but yeah, that's why they are the ringing cedars. Have you heard it? Have I heard them? No. They're incredibly rare and you have to go like deep in the taiga for that. And, um, I know Vladimir has experienced them, but not many other people have, yeah. Is it cut it down and utilize it for... Yeah. Level? So basically, this is a great question too. Um, the point was to cut... Their, her grandfathers were saying that you cut down this cedar that stored up this energy and you give it to people like in the form of a pendant, right? And so they wear this pendant and it can cure them of all, of every disease, they said. The ringing cedar can cure a person of every disease, um, make a person kinder, more successful, and just a kinder, more beautiful person. Um, so many people wear uh, pieces of Siberian cedar. I have several that I'm wearing. Two of them are more than 400 years old. Dr. Edith has one that I gave her. Yeah, I have three actually, I'm kind of crazy. Uh, but, you know, that's for certain people, um, you know, um, but the energy that comes from these is incredibly strong and beneficial to people. Um, so if you're curious, wearing one, it's like, I kind of, I kind of see it like it's a cheat code for life, honestly. It's going to give me all this wonderful energy and just help me, and it's beautiful, so why not wear it? Um, so I encourage everyone to have some cedar, the Siberian cedar. There you go. That's great. Thank you, brother. And I've got some gifts for people if you want after. I have seeds of uh, Lebanon cedar trees. Oh, nice. Yeah. I have Lebanon cedar seeds. They're incredibly rare, endangered tree, but I'm happy to give out some seeds. Um, yes. Oh, I'm so sorry. Who, who had their hands up? Did you, I'm sorry. I didn't even see. Please. Sure. First, why are you? Sure. 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 No. It's a great question. Thank you for asking that question. So, um, Kristen's question is about religion and do people need to follow a specific religious denomination or set of beliefs to, to live this way? And the answer is definitely no. Um, 
many, I mean, people from every kind of religion live this way. Um, and it's not exclusive to any people or anything like that because it's a natural way of life that um, can be done everywhere in the world, right? We're living in harmony with nature and, and giving birth to our children this way and creating these kind of spaces. So whatever you believe um, is just enhanced by this lifestyle, right? Um, you can have your devotion to Christ. You can have your devotion to Buddha or, or anything that you feel and still live this way. Um, and all of it works together.